Hi there, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. In this video, we're going to take a look at the NVIDIA RTX 3080 Ti. We've obtained this EVGA FTW3 model, and we're going to look at some of the performance figures it generates, and see whether it's a worthwhile option when you're looking at, say, an RTX 3080, or as an upgrade from an RTX 2080 Ti, perhaps. We'll run through the metrics, and we'll come up with some conclusions about what kind of value it can offer you, if that's any at all. In June, NVIDIA released new GPUs including the RTX 3080 Ti. This high-end GPU uses the same GA102 core as the RTX 3090 and the RTX 3080 that bracket it, as well as 12GB of GDDR6X VRAM. This GPU offers an absolutely top drawer experience, but can it possibly justify the price tag? In this review we've pitted it against the RTX 3080 and the AMD RX 6800 XT, as well as the top tier of the last generation NVIDIA cards, the RTX 2080 Ti to find out what it offers. Let's take a look at the core specifications. In this table, we can see how closely the RTX 3080 Ti matches the key specifications of the RTX 3090. The principal difference is the halving of VRAM capacity from 24GB to 12GB. This is still ample for gaming, but reduces the cost of parts significantly with the Micron and Video exclusive GDDR6X costing around $100 per 10GB. It uses the same 384-bit bus providing very high bandwidth access to the VRAM, and this is the real reason for the slight increase to 12GB over the 3080's 10GB. The wider bus requires 12GB of VRAM or multiples of that. The core itself loses just 256 of over 10,000 shader units versus the 3090, and 8 tensor cores and 2 RTX cores. This is a near identical specification to the 3090, which indicates that it should perform very similarly too. Of the other important specifications, we can't compare shader units across to the AMD card or the last generation RTX 2080 Ti, as they're different architectures. The same goes for ray tracing cores. The RX 6800 XT posts impressive theoretical fill rates, but from testing we know that it matches the RTX 3080 incredibly closely in rasterized gaming performance. Finally, we come on to pricing, and that's really where the controversy lies with this card. Originally, it was always rumored as to be around a $1,000 card, but when they announced pricing, we find that it's actually $1,200. When you compare that to the launch pricing of the RTX 3080, which was touted at $650 to $700 for founders or add-in cards, you can see that that's a significant price hike. Of course, the RTX 3090 was originally a $1,500 card, but that very quickly became a pipe dream, and because it's a card that can earn you $10 a day just by mining when it's idle, prices came to reflect that, and suddenly it was a card that was two to two and a half thousand dollars to buy on a highly inflated new and used market. With these prices in mind, Nvidia clearly looked at their pricing strategy and thought that there was easily another two hundred dollars value in an RTX 3080 Ti that they could exploit for, for extra revenue. This increased cost is passed on to the retailers and of course ultimately the consumer, and it's clearly the price that Nvidia feel that the market will bear for a card of this performance. And looking at pricing and sales across the spectrum of cards, they'd appear to be correct in that judgement. How it leaves you feeling is of course down to you. You can make a persuasive argument that no gaming GPU is worth $1500, but that's something we'll look at once we've had a look at the benchmark results. I've divided these benchmarks up game by game, and run all resolutions so you can focus in on what's most relevant to you. I'll highlight at this point that none of the cards in this test should be run at 1080p, it's simply a waste of their potential and your money, but the numbers are there anyway for you to consider. For our test bench, we've maintained the same test bench of the Ryzen 5800X, a B550 motherboard, and 16GB of 3600MHz RAM, CL16, with Infinity Fabric and Memory Clock set 1 to 1 ratio. We ran a Fractal Designs Ion Platinum 860W power supply to ensure adequate power. This is a high performance system with the 5800X the equal of any CPU available right now in terms of gaming performance. It's optimised with good RAM speed, but not overclocked beyond PBO being enabled. We want this test bench to represent the kind of system this GPU would actually be used with. In keeping with this, we run games at representative high to ultra settings to show the kind of performance you can actually expect in game. Simply cranking all the settings to ultra often misrepresents a GPU's actual performance through overburdening either it or the CPU with settings that haven't been optimised and trash performance for little visual gain. Firstly, let's take a look at our synthetic benchmark suite, starting with 3 Mark's Firestrike. Firestrike is the DirectX 11 test and renders in 1080p. The 6800 XT excels in this, and the RTX 3080 Ti still can't beat its score, giving away nearly 5,000 points. However, it does have a clear margin of performance to the RTX 3080, 6,000 points behind it, 
and then the RTX 2080 Ti is over 10,000 points behind the RTX 3080 Ti overall. Time Spy shows the 3080 Ti leapfrog the RX 6800 XT in this DirectX 12 based 1440p graphics test. It's more representative of current games. It's 1500 points ahead of the AMD card and 2500 points ahead of the RTX 3080. There's over 5000 points lead above the RTX 2080 Ti. To test ray tracing we can take a quick look at the scores in Port Royal. Here the RTX 3080 Ti uses its 12 ray tracing core advantage to romp home 2000 points above the RTX 3080 and 4000 points ahead of both the RTX 2080 Ti and the RX 6800 XT. It's the clear winner in this test, but with more RT cores and the Nvidia next generation cores, this is what you'd expect. Moving on to games, Warzone is first up. We test this by running a 5-6 to six minute battle royale against bots and logging metrics throughout. The recent update knocked performance back about 15% across the board, and I've had to omit the RX 6800 XT as we no longer have it available for testing. It performed near identically to the RTX 3080, so please take that as a proxy. Warzone proves itself a stern test of both CPU and GPU, and we can't generate the very high frames per second that some other shooters can. The 3080 Ti only marginally outperforms the 3080 at 1080p, scoring 221 frames per second average to 213 frames per second average. At 1440p again there's only a 10 frame per second difference, 180 frames per second to 170 frames per second, which isn't in keeping with the on-paper specification difference. At ultra wide 1440p we see a little wider gap proportionally with 16 frames per second difference. You can see the RTX 2080 Ti is 30 frames per second behind throughout. And finally at 4K we see the 3080 Ti post just over 100 frames per second at 110, whilst the 3080 makes 96 frames per second. Overall, in Warzone we don't see a performance gap commensurate with either specification or pricing of these GPUs. Rainbow Six Siege is much faster running across the board, and again retesting means we omit the RX 6800 XT here. At 1080p, 1440p, 1440p ultrawide and 4K, you can see the RTX 3080 Ti posts about a 10% uplift versus the RTX 3080. There's no yawning gap in performance here, just a few more frames. Doom Eternal uses Vulcan drivers and is well optimised, and here we can compare the RX 6800 XT which performs well at lower resolutions. The RTX 3080 Ti has a more convincing lead over the RTX 3080 in this title, particularly at higher resolutions. At 1440p it holds 330 frames per second versus 274 for the RTX 3080, and at ultra wide it's 266 frames per second over the RTX 3080's 238 frames per second. At 4K the 3080 Ti manages 186 frames per second in our testing, with the RTX 3080 and the RX 6800 XT tied at 160 frames per second. Moving on to the AAA titles in our test suite and looking at Red Dead Redemption 2, the RTX 3080 Ti again tops the chart but not by a huge amount. Just 10 frames per second separates it from the 3080 across the board, from 1080p to 4K. In actual gameplay that's just not a difference that's going to be noticeable to you, you're going to get fast fluid frame rates at high settings with either GPU. Shadow of the Tomb Raider has always shown good scaling with hardware, and isn't particularly CPU limited for the bulk of the benchmark run, although it is in the final village scene to provide a good overview of system performance. Here it's no different, with a good 20% advantage over the RTX 3080, 40 frames per second faster at 1080p, 20 frames per second faster at 1440p and 1440p ultrawide, and 17 frames per second better at 4K. Those are fairly impressive steps up in isolation. And finally we have a cautionary tale delivered by Flight Sim 2020, our custom benchmark is designed to fully tax CPU and GPU with a low level 3 minute AI controlled flight over Manhattan. I've shown results for both average performance and 1% lows here to better illustrate my point. This GPU is not the performance saviour for Flight Sim 2020. You can see that this game is CPU limited with all of these GPUs at 1080p, 1440p and 1440p ultra wide. Only at 4K does the RTX 3080 Ti pull ahead, but even then it's matched by the RTX 3080 and we're still CPU limited to around 48 frames per second average. The long story cut short here is that despite reputations, Flight Sim isn't actually that GPU dependent. You need a top flight CPU to make this game run well. In our testing of Flight Sim 2020 we know that the Ryzen 5800X performs as well as any other CPU in this game. One possible justifiable usage case for an RTX 3080 Ti in Flight Sim would be for example running a multi-monitor setup where you're using several high resolution displays and again that will shift the balance of performance over to the GPU and a GPU as powerful as the RTX 3080 Ti would allow you to maintain higher frame rates and higher settings across many monitors. 
Looking at ray tracing performance, this is a more subjective assessment of the experience. That's for a few reasons. First is the hand and glove nature of RTX and DLSS, with the upsampling technology giving a massive boost to performance, but also allowing you to tweak settings to your preference of fidelity against frame rates. Secondly, it's because of the fast evolving nature of RTX implementations in games. We've also seen big step up in DLSS with 2.0 and its uh, integration into some other titles. Games like Control and Metro Exodus Remastered really do show this feature off well, with naturalistic lighting and well-judged effects. I've been playing Metro Exodus Remastered at 1440p ultrawide and RTX on, but no DLSS assistance, and the play is fast, fluid and utterly gorgeous. The long and short of it is that this GPU offers one of the best gaming experiences currently available, but that's only what you'd expect for a range-topping GPU. We can take a quick look at temperatures and power draw on this card. Running default settings and logging metrics through a times by run to give a load representative of gaming, we see the RTX 3080 Ti draw around 390 to 400 watts under load. Temperatures on this FTW3 card remain acceptable, with the core reaching around 75 degrees Celsius and the GDDR6X memory junction temperatures at 86 Celsius. This is pretty good, under heavy load we can expect VRAM temperatures to reach 95 degrees C and GDDR6X will run as hot as 105 degrees C under continuous heavy loads or when airflow is restricted. Many owners resort to modifying their cards with thermal pads to transmit heat away from the VRAM and into the backplate. Overall, the power draw of this card in particular will demand a very capable power supply to run it, and you may want to investigate undervolting it to keep power draw and temperatures lower as well. Particularly when comparing it to the RTX 3080, which draws around 340 watts, this card consumes 20% more power for 10% or so more performance. Not a great result, comparatively speaking. A good quality 750 watt power supply should be considered a minimum for this card. We did test it with a high quality 650 watt power supply, the Antec Earthwatts Gold, and it forced system shutdowns on a few occasions. What it boils down to then is, is this GPU worth the $1,500 that's currently being asked for it? The answer is unequivocally no. There's no way you can justify that price hike, particularly over MSRP pricing for an RTX 3080, in the performance numbers we've just seen. This is a card that at best performs about 10% better than the RTX 3080. You lose virtually nothing by opting for the RTX 3080 instead, and lowering just a few settings for an equivalent experience. It has all the same features, capability, and it uses only two-thirds the power. The trouble is, of course, I'm saying that as if RTX 3080s are readily available at anything close to MSRP. So we're left with a couple of ways of looking at this. First, you can criticise Nvidia for releasing a product that's only marginally better, but for a substantially higher price. That's a valid criticism. That happened with the RTX 2080 Ti as well, but they still sold well. In my opinion, this all stems from the first GPU crisis around 2017, when high-end cards like the GTX 1080 Ti were exchanging hands for well over $1,000 on the used or scalp market. This I think acted as a little bit of an eye-opener for Nvidia, proving that enthusiasts were willing to outbid miners for the best gaming card of each generation. It also stopped them being shy of that four-figure price tag for a gaming GPU. Some people see this as being ripped off, others see it as just a factor of market forces, especially when you've got competition between miners, gamers, content creators, all of whom want these cards, and particularly with the backdrop of obviously the pandemic as well, it's pushed demand and supply in both directions and created a perfect storm where prices can only rise. The bad feeling originates from the fact that Nvidia are exploiting this combination of factors to ask more money for a card that doesn't justify it in its performance. If you remember at the start of this video I spoke about how with 12 gigabytes less VRAM to buy, that should be a saving on the bill of materials of around $100, and it's quite clear Nvidia are not passing that saving on to consumers by pricing this card accordingly. You can also look at products like the RTX 3080 Ti as a luxury good, they clearly are, but like a watch or a handbag, they clearly don't justify the price that are being asked for them in the features they have. When viewed like this, objective metrics break down. If you're buying the latest Porsche, you don't care that it's only 0.1 seconds faster to 60 than the outgoing model, or that it's $50,000 more. You simply want the best Porsche currently available, and that's what you buy. These cars still have waiting lists for them, and there are people out there who can afford them. GPUs are exactly the same. Some people have the money to spend and are happy to spend it on a prestige good. How you feel about all of this is likely down to your own personal assessment of value. There's no arguing that this card is good value, it is obviously a bad value card. It's absolutely gutting at the moment that products like this exist when there's no affordable option for gamers. If this card existed alongside $450 RTX 3060 Ti's and $700 RTX 3080's, it wouldn't feel like such an egregious situation. 
It's the fact that people feel compelled to spend this amount just to get a graphics card that leaves a slight hint of exploitation in the air. In short, you should only consider the RTX 3080 Ti if money literally isn't a thing to you, in which case presumably the RTX 3090 is also in reach. But that 24GB of VRAM is still wasted on games. I absolutely love the way that this card performs in VR, on high resolution monitors in AAA titles, and in being able to run games at very close to ultra settings with fantastically smooth performance and really experience the visual flair that the designers put into games like Metro Exodus Remastered, Control, Red Dead Redemption 2, Flight Sim 2020 on high settings, all of these titles look absolutely fabulous on this card. I absolutely hate the price and the fact that people feel pushed to pay this much for a graphics card that simply doesn't justify it in terms of its raw performance. Hopefully this market is going to correct in time. In my opinion, we're seeing some early signs of that happening right now. And with mining slowing down and the supply situation easing, I do think that things are actually going to change in the next few months. And if you can wait, I would suggest you wait for a little while to buy a GPU. I think we're going to see some significant changes. And particularly if you want to look on the second hand market, I think we're going to see, actually start to see some good value options come to light in the near future. Premium Builds is your go-to resource for reviews, component advice, and part selection. Please check out the website for a plethora of information that will help make your next PC as good as it can be.